Hey, this is Pastor Spencer with Racine Bible Church. You're listening to a message from our sermon series in Isaiah. What a sweet, sweet sound. My favorite people in the world singing about the greatest, the greatest blessing in life, the Savior's love for us. As we open God's word, let's ask God to open our hearts. Let's pray. Even now, great and loving Savior, even now, let my heart be filled with love. Even now, great Savior, let my spirit be filled with zeal. Let my words be filled with wisdom. Jesus, that you may be glorified and that your people may be edified. Amen. If you look with me at Isaiah 62, if you look with me at Isaiah 62, that's our text this morning, and it can be summarized really with two main points from Isaiah chapter 62. And both of these points, there are only two of them, but each one of them, it's my prayer that each one of these will awaken you to reality and will renew your passion for God and his love and his glory. So let Isaiah 62 and these two simple points awaken you to reality and renew your passion for God's love. The first truth out of Isaiah 62 is that God will save his people. That God will save his people. And what that means is he will give his people forgiveness. He'll give his people light. He'll give his people glory. He'll give his people love. And perhaps the most stunning truth about God saving his people that's revealed in Isaiah 62 is this. God will delight in saving his people. God will render to himself, so to speak, joy and happiness and delight in saving his people. And the second truth out of Isaiah 62 is that God's saved people will call out to God in prayer. God's saved people will delight to call out to God in prayer, to wait for him, to trust him, to look to him. Isaiah 62 is really about God's passion in saving his people, and it's also about the passion that God's people have to call out to God in prayer. God's passion for our salvation when he rejoices to make us beautiful and our passion for God in prayer when we rejoice that he meets our needs and we lift everything up to him in prayerful requests. So let's look at this together. Isaiah chapter 62. Reading verses one and two. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nation shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. Isaiah begins this text with a prayer, really, that God's people will be the light that God has designed them to be. You know, God created Israel to be a lighthouse for the world. In the old covenant and in the new covenant, God created the church to be a lighthouse for the world. It calls us a burning torch so that everyone around can see God's light and God's righteousness. This same thought was in Isaiah 55, verses 12 and 13. Isaiah 55, 12. You shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace, and the mountains and the hills before you shall break into singing, and the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of thorns will come up cypresses, instead of briars will come up myrtle, and it shall make a name for the Lord and an everlasting sign that will never be cut off. It's God's plan that in the end, Jerusalem will shine so beautifully when Jesus returns to her that all the nations will see what kind of a savior Jesus is. We saw this same theme in Isaiah 60, 
verses 1 through 3. Again, the light metaphor. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, thick darkness on the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen among you, and nations shall come to your light, the kings to the brightness of your rising. We're to be a light for all the world to see. And when the world looks at the church, what the world is supposed to see is how God loves his people. And would you look, if I could say so tenderly and touchingly and even almost in a romantic way, the way verse two says it, the end of verse two, you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. Isaiah 62 verse 2 says that God loves you so much if you are in the church, if you are the redeemed. God loves you so much. God draws you so closely to himself that God, so to speak, gives you a beloved nickname. I'm not just going to call you your name that your mama gave you. No offense to your mama. But God loves you so much that he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna give you his special kind of sweetheart kind of name. This is the extension and the human expression of the affection and the passion and the love that the Savior has for his people. Marvelous. Marvelous. Going on in verses 3, 4, and 5. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken. Your land will no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called, my delight is in her and your land married, Beulah, for the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. As the young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. These verses, again, are about the, the, the matchless, marvelous love that God has for his people. Verse 3 says that his people are a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord. Not merely that he wears the crown, and not merely that God's people, speaking of God's people as a woman, that she would wear the crown, that God's people would wear the crown, but that God's people will be a beautiful crown in the hand of of the Lord, kept in his hand. Kept in his hand means treasured by him, valued by him. Sort of going over and over how beautiful this is and just enjoying your presence. And I think verses one through five reach their climax at the end of verse five when it simply says in the ESV, so shall your God rejoice over you. The, I suppose, technical term for this is an anthropopathism where we speak of human passions, but we speak of God having human passions. It's technically, theologically, not literal that God has the same passions that humans have. He's impassable. But yet, to, to convey the immeasurable realities of the heart of God, it says in the end of verse 5 that God will rejoice over his people. It's an impressive reminder that God's commitment to salvation is not casual. And God's commitment to our salvation is not uh, punk sort of just rote and routine and it's a job that he has to do. No, it's determined and focused and filled with passionate love. We get the joy of a new name and of beauty and of forgiveness and God gets the joy of giving that to us out of his great love for us. Verse five compares it to, a, verse five compares in this anthropopathism, verse five compares God to a young man at the, at the front of this aisleway dressed up for his wedding, watching his beautiful bride walk forward to join herself to him. 
It says this is the kind of passion that God has, the kind of rejoicing that God has. I suppose it's, it's fair also to compare this not only to a wedding, but to the joy that, let's talk about a mom. If, 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 you're, the, if you're the right kind of mom, something good, something good happens to your kids and you actually get more delight out of that than your kids do because you love your kids so much that their rejoicing and their happiness and their beauty and their glory is just magnified exponentially in your heart. This is describing the indescribable of the beating heart of God in our salvation. Now we'll come back to verses six and seven and the watchmen on the walls and what this says about prayer, that those in prayer, it says in verse six, they put the Lord in remembrance and they take no rest and they give the Lord no rest until he accomplishes these things. But to look down through to the end, we'll come back to that for our second point on prayer. Picking it up, say, in uh, verse eight. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm, I will not again give your grain to be food for your enemies and foreigners shall not drink your wine for which you have labored. But those who garner it shall eat it and praise the Lord and those who gather it shall drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. Go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, clear it of stones, lift up a signal over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughters of Zion, behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you shall be called sought out a city, not forsaken. The way Isaiah 62 puts this together, couldn't we put the whole, couldn't we put the whole, sort of the whole Bible story together in, in, in 60 seconds or less? God makes this covenant with Abraham, this unconditional covenant. He says, I'm going to bless you and your descendants are going to be like the stars in the heaven, the sands on the seashore. Abraham obeys God and he goes out faithfully and God's people become so numerous and then what happens is they they get jammed up in Egypt and then there's the Exodus. Moses leads them out and there's there's this covenant at Sinai which is perhaps in some ways unconditional but in other ways clearly the text makes it conditional where God says, if you follow my law, you'll have the land and you'll have the blessing, and you'll see it. But if you don't, you'll lose the land, and you'll lose the blessing. And we know what happened, because they were like us. They didn't keep the law, and they lost the blessing, and they were out of the, trounced out of the promised land and into exile. But that's not the end of the story. Isaiah says here, there is a fullness of time coming when God will regather, unconditionally regather his people and place them in their land again where no one will steal anything from them forever. The completion of all of God's promises in the millennial kingdom. That's what he's talking about here. Church, I think maybe perhaps one little way that that should apply in your conscience and in your life today is that Isaiah should give you the confidence that God will accomplish his plans. Some of you come in here, many of you come in here in a year, a month, a season, when all your plans are just being pulverized. And it's easy to judge God based on the frailty of our human disappointments day after day. But God will accomplish his plans. May I put it like this? If you could ruin God's plans, you would because you're unreliable and you're weak. But the good news is that God has plans that no angelic power and certainly no human power can thwart or stop. And God will accomplish his plans for salvation. We have to trust him. 
We have to understand his promises. We have to walk by faith and not by sight. Then verses 10 through 12 use the the common illustration in Isaiah of a highway. He says they're building a highway. And the highway is to Jerusalem where Jesus is reigning. And all these promises that the enemies of Jerusalem will no longer steal her grain or steal her vineyards and her wine. This is, this is true when the king comes and he reigns from the throne of David in Jerusalem. The return and the reign of Jesus Christ where everybody streams in to see him. When they stream in to see Jesus, what if one of the most stunning things about Jesus, according to Isaiah 62, verse 5, is how much joy Jesus has in saving his people? What a reflective thing to, what a, what a reflective glory to praise the Lord for forever and ever, the joy that he has in saving us. So the first point is God's passionate joy in saving his people. And if I could press this into your life with one element of application, would you compare? Would you be self-aware enough to compare your love for God's people with God's love for God's people? Would you be bold enough, brave enough, self-aware enough to compare your love for God's people with God's love for God's people? And say, God, help me love your church the way you love your church. Pastoral word is, you should love the church because Jesus commands you to love the church. But deeper than that, you shouldn't merely love the church because Jesus told you to love the church. Deeper than that, you should love the church because Jesus loves the church. And the happiest way to live is to get in behind the slipstream of Jesus and his passion and his love and let that affect you so that you move the way Jesus moves. This is what he's calling us to. You should be faithful to the church because because God says be faithful to the church. But that's not the only reason that you should be. You should be faithful to the church. You should be forgiving toward the church. You should let go of bitterness toward the church, not merely because God commands you to, but because God is faithful to the church and God is forgiving toward the church. And you want to get in behind who God is and what he's doing and be filled with his spirit. Love the church the way Jesus does. Love the church the way God does. Perhaps that's challenge enough for application off of that first point of God's passion in saving his people. The second truth out of Isaiah 62 that I wish would awaken you is this truth about prayer. Verses six and seven, look at it. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen. All the day and all the night, they shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in the earth. The term for watchmen is an interesting term in the prophets, that term watchmen in verse six. In Daniel 4 and in Zechariah 1, the watchmen are the angels who keep guard over his people. But that's not the way that it should be interpreted here. Because here, it's the watchmen who speak to the Lord about establishing Jerusalem, and the immediate context is the women and the men who are committed to God's ministry and who pray. I take it as women and men who pray because the surrounding promises aren't to the angels, but they're to the people who are calling out to God to accomplish his purposes. Prayer is how we cling to God. Prayer is how we lift our requests to God. Prayer is how we press God to do what he's promised to do. Let's talk about the Bible and prayer. God gives us a Bible because God wants to speak to us. God gives us the Bible and that is him speaking to us. In the Bible, God teaches us how to pray and God commands us to pray because in prayer, 
We talk to God. Bible's how God talks to us. Prayer's how we talk to God. But what about the fusion of bringing the Bible into our prayer? What if, we would, what, what if we would become empowered in prayer, not merely by speaking of ourselves to God, but the Bible gets inside of us, works inside of our hearts. There's this fusion activity from the Holy Spirit so that we plead back to God what his word has taught us, how his word has challenged us and given us hope. What if... The surest prayers, what if the sharpest arrows of prayers are when we plead back to God the initial promises that he delivered to us in his word? That's getting at what this is getting at. Because Isaiah 62 is a promise that God will, that Jesus will return and reign from Jerusalem and protect Jerusalem forever. So, then you could just kind of squint your eyes like doctrinally and be like, well, has God already fixed a day when he's going to return? Yes. But Spencer, you're telling us right now that every day we should pray that today would be the day that he'd return. Yes. Well, is that going to change the day that, well, it's it's not going to necessarily change God's plans, but God has promised that, that when we pray, we will be a part of his plan And God has promised this, every day you don't pray for his return is a day that the world makes you more blind, more deaf, and more dumb. And every day you pray for his return is a day when the vision of God opens your eyes to what he is doing in the world. Pray. Pray without ceasing. Notice I think, it's the, I think it's God who is the referent of the first person pl- personal pronoun in verse six. I don't think Isaiah set the watchman there. I think God set the watchman there. And that's why the watchmen are, are licensed, so to speak, to be super bold. God's not offended by their bold intercession. And notice what it says. All the day and all the night. And go ahead and... Write me a long email about what that leaves out. Like when you have a hall pass not to pray. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest and give him no rest. What's that about? Give him no rest. That's about the toughness and the tenacity and the incessant nature of Christian prayer. Just didn't do a Mother's Day sermon today. Not sorry about that. Isaiah 62 is better than some fluffy thing I could come up with about moms. But a little shout out to moms. There is nothing tougher and more tenacious than the prayers of a mother. It's old. A, not old, aging woman. She's 72. Her son is 52. And she says to her 52-year-old son who is uh, worldly, filled with lust, drunkenness, dishonors Jesus, is not converted. And the 72-year-old mom says to her 52-year-old son, I have given heaven no rest since the day that you were born, that you would be born again. And my boy, if you manage to crawl your way into hell, you will be crawling over the mounds and hills and mountains of prayers that I sent to heaven for you. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I've set watchmen all the day, all the night. They shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest and give him no rest. This is Genesis 32. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. The prayer of Jacob when his name is changed, Genesis 32, verses 24 through 28. 
It says there Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he didn't prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And then he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Not only is this Jacob... This is from Luke 11, from Luke chapter 11. This is the, this is the, 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 the persistent friend. Luke chapter 11, verse uh, five. He said to them, which of you has a friend who goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I've got nothing to set before him. And he'll answer from within, don't bother me. The door is shut and my children are with me in bed and I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you though, he will not give up and give him anything because he's his friend. Yet because of his impudence, he'll get up and give him whatever he needs. I tell you, ask and it'll be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it'll be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, it'll be open. Not only is this Jacob from Genesis 32, not only is this the persistent friend from Luke 11, This is also from Luke 18. This is also from Luke 18, the persistent widow or pejoratively the nagging old lady. Luke 11, verse one. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and never lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice, 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 give me justice against my adversary. And for a while he refused. But afterward, he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, Yet, because of this widow who keeps bothering me, I'll go ahead and give her justice so so she won't beat me down by her continually coming. The Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? on the earth. Isaiah 62 verse 7 says that the watchmen give God no rest in their prayers. What a bold way of putting it. I know too many Bible verses that say that God doesn't need any rest and God never slumbers or sleeps. I know too many of those verses that would hold me back from being that creative and that bold in my preaching. But apparently Isaiah has no such hold back. So he says, don't give God any rest. Go ahead and annoy God with your assistance so that that God just has to do it, even if he doesn't feel like it. It's such a strange way of putting it. I wouldn't be gutsy enough to put it that way. But that's the way that we are to pray. Sometimes praying for something is like, I've got a, I think it's by Stephen Ambrose, this book about how they built the transcontinental Transcontinental Railroad, wonderful little history book about how these tough, rough men chiseled through granite to build that railroad. And sometimes praying is is like that. It's like these, these rough, muscled, men who have a pickaxe or they, they, had a, they had a hand cranked drill that went into the granite. The granite, the mountain isn't God. The mountain isn't God. We're drilling into the rock. The rock in this picture is what we're praying about. My son's unbelief, the, the Muslim dominance in Turkey, the the disunity on the church board, the difficulty in ministry, whatever it is. We are with our pickaxe and with our cranked drill, we are just drilling into that problem, making that request to God, making that request to God and drilling that that hole deeper and deeper, deeper in. We're not in control. 
of when, but there is a foreman on the job site who decides when that hole is far enough in, then the dynamite goes in. That's his call, not ours. All we can do is drill. All we can do is drill. But we know there is dynamite, and it is on the way. We wait, and we wait, and we wait until the foreman decides, drop it in, light the fuse, back off, because now it's coming down. Day and night, never be silent. Put the Lord in remembrance. Take no rest. Give him no rest until he establishes his promises. If I could ask you to look at one more scripture, it would be Psalm 127. And if I'd ask you to write down one more thing, it would be this. Pray relentlessly and then rest prayerfully. Pray relentlessly and then rest prayerfully. Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Pray relentlessly and rest prayerfully. We have our key word, watchman, and we have our key word, beloved, sleep. Here's a word for worried parents, worried grandparents. Here's a word for elders, deacons, ABF leaders, workers here in the church who are shouldering the weight of difficult ministry. Unless the Lord builds the house, 127.1, those who build it labor in vain. The Lord's oversight matters most. The Lord's work matters most. The Lord's knowledge matters most. But you see what it says. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. So if you're, if you're reading this with me, the builder is building the watchman is staying awake and watching. You've got to do what God's called you to do. You should work hard. You should care. You should pray. You should be involved in the give and take and the difficulty of parenting and grandparenting and ministry and being a friend and confronting sin and forgiving and all the rest of it. But your diligent work and your staying awake to do it won't make the ultimate difference. In fact, after you've done what God's called you to do, God gives to his beloved sleep. Pray relentlessly and then rest prayerfully. We obey him. We do what he calls us to do. We trust him. We lift our prayers up to him day and night. And then he can give to us sleep. What Isaiah 62 is meant to make you believe is that God is more committed to accomplishing his purposes than you will ever be. Now, God is commanding you to obey him and be a part of fulfilling his purposes. But the ultimate fulfillment of God's purposes depends upon God. So you do what he's called you to do, and then you go to sleep. You trust him. You trust him. So week by week, as a faithful, diligent pastor, I am trying to get you to quit being lazy and get more involved and pray more and work more and everything else. But week after week, as a faithful pastor, the last thing I'm trying to do is load on to you night after night of sleeplessness where you feel like everything depends on you because it doesn't. Pray relentlessly. And beloved, I think it is those and only those who pray relentlessly, who can then rest prayerfully because they know this arm can't do it. These eyes staying glued open can't do it. It belongs to God. It belongs to God. And he will accomplish 
all of his good pleasure. And in fact, he will rejoice and delight in the accomplishment of his plans. Trust him, church. Trust him. Let's pray. Lord God, we hallow your name for you have revealed to us afresh how passionately you pursue your glory in our salvation. Lord God, we are stunned that as a bridegroom rejoices in seeing his bride, so our God would delight in saving us. This overwhelms us that we've been loved in such a way And God, we would be those who remember this moment by moment, hour by hour, day and night. And so we would be those who pray relentlessly. And in so doing, because we really lift our requests up to you, we would be those who receive the gift of sleep that we might rest prayerfully. Lord, hear every prayer, hear the cry of every heart in the women and men who have gathered today. And Lord Jesus, be glorified in answering the prayers of your people, surely for our good, but more than anything, for your great glory in your church. Amen. Amen. To find out more about our ministry, contact us at racinebible.org. Thank you for listening.